So, welcome everybody to the September 13th, 2016 meeting of the Mississippi PowerShell User Group. Tonight we have guest Aaron Jensen, and he's going to be presenting about or presenting on release pipeline patterns with PowerShell. So, take it away, Aaron. Oops, hold on. There we go. Hello, everybody. Thanks for uh, uh, having me speak at your uh, at your user group here. This is going to be uh, hopefully this will be interesting and educational for everybody. I'm going to talk about release pipeline patterns. Uh, my background, just to give you a little bit of information, I'm I come from a development background. I've been a software developer for many many years. And it usually uh, turned out that I was the one that took over responsibility for our builds and our deployments and our automation. Um, most developers, for whatever reason, didn't seem to, uh, too keen on that. And so uh, at my current job, that's what I do. I manage uh, builds, pipelines, auto, uh, deployments, uh, and, uh, and automation. And so in this presentation, I'm going to talk about release pipelines, what they are, um, what the, some of the tools we use here at WebMD to, in our release pipelines to, to kind of grease the wheels and get our software deployed. And then I'll talk about what kind of release pipeline patterns you can use when you're developing your own PowerShell modules and PowerShell code. So this is what a release pipeline looks like. Uh, you start out with your code. Uh, it gets checked into source control, the Git or Mercurial or Subversion or something like that by developers. And then that software gets built, compiled usually, uh, depending on what the kind of software it is. It gets tested, and then after it passes tests, it gets released and deployed out to customers. Uh, let's dive into these a little bit in detail. So first of all, code gets checked into source. Anything that gets deployed to any environment should be checked into source control, whether those are certificates or installation scripts or whatever you need on a server somewhere to get your software running uh, should be checked into source control. If you don't, if, uh, and I'm not sure, it seems uh, in the PowerShell community, a lot of people come from a background where they haven't necessarily used source. And I definitely recommend that if you don't know how to use source control, that you uh, pick up Git. That you seems to be the most popular option. Uh, the other options include Mercurial, which is like Git, but a little bit simpler, and then Subversion. A TFS or some other ones that, that people use. And one of the reasons you want to use source code is because I don't know if anybody recognizes this kind of uh, file listing in your directory structure where uh, you want to make changes to your uh, home page. And so you make a copy of the old version and then you start working on the new version. And next thing you go, you got a dozen files in your file system. And, and you're never quite sure which one was when. And, uh, and that's the problem that version control solves is you check in files to a version control, and, and that system keeps track of what that file looked like at each time that you committed it. So you can always you can go back in history. It's like a time machine. Go back in history. Uh, you can do things like tag specific uh, things in, in version control. So you can say, OK, version 5 and uh, change that 5 in version control. That's when we release version 1.0 of our software, version 1.1. So if you have a critical bug fix, it needs to go live or anything like that. You can just update your source control to that revision, make your bug fix, and then deploy just the bug fix on top of whatever was on your live environment. Pretty handy. Uh, next is the is the build phase. This is where you take all your source source code and you create binaries out of them. And .NET land that's usually assemblies, DLLs. Uh, PowerShell modules sometimes have assemblies that they that they use. Uh, most of my the modules that I have do that. Uh, some uh, depending on the software, you don't, you don't necessarily even need to compile anything. But what you should have at the end of the day, at the end of your build, is you should have a package of some kind that you use to deploy your software. And that can be as simple as just a directory structure that gets copied across, or it can be a NuGet package, or it can be a zip file, whatever, whatever works best for you and for your software. The key is that everything that you need to get that, that software running should be part of that package. So, Obviously, the application, uh, if you have any database scripts, those will be part of the package. If you have any install scripts, those will be part of the package as well. Uh, certificates to install, anything like that should all be part of this package that gets, that gets deployed out. And then next, you take that package and you test it. You make sure that it's going to work when you deploy it out to your environment. This is, it, this is the most important stage, because th at this stage, this is where 
hopefully built up automated processes and automated tests that tell you this software is okay to deploy. It's stable, it's solid, it passes all our tests. And answer the question, is it safe to release? Um, and if you ever have, uh, if some, sometimes bugs get through, and when those bugs get through, you should always go back and run a test that reproduces that bug so that you never have it creep back up in the future. And in subsequent builds and test cycles, that, that test will run. Uh, in PowerShell land, uh, the, the de facto testing tool is Pester. And as a de, de, uh, coming from a development background, I'm, I've used uh, test-driven de, de, test development uh, with uh, all my PowerShell modules and all my PowerShell code. And recently, that I, uh, I've started to use Pester within the last year or so and become familiar with that. And it uses a, what's called behavior-driven development. Um, so with test-driven development, it's really interesting. You write your tests before you actually write your production code. And this does a couple things for you. It, it makes sure that your, your code is actually, it gives you, you're actually testing your tests almost. You're writing the test, and you see that it fails, and then you write code that makes it pass, and you see it pass, and it gives you a warm, fuzzy feeling that, yes, you've done the right thing, you've written the right test, and you've written the right, the right code. Uh, and it also helps make your code maintainable, because you're writing code to use code that you haven't written yet, and so it makes your functions a little bit better, it makes your design a little bit better. And as far as behavior-driven design goes, that's way, that's, this is just a way of structuring your tests so that it's kind of use case driven. So use cases are statements about how people would use your software. So, um, and so you would write up a, a test case in Pester that says, okay, when somebody uses my software with this switch, and then you write a test that describes what should happen. So we'll do a little demo. I'm going to drop in here. Uh, let's see here. Just some, and write some PowerShell. So this is a, one of my modules is called Carbon. We'll talk a, little, a lot more about it. But So that, for this example, we've got a function called install file. It's really simple. All, it, all it's going to do is it's just going to create a file in the file system if it doesn't exist. So this is the, the skeleton of the, of the function. It's got about documentation. And it's blank. It's got no, no no logic yet. So we're gonna come over here. We'll do some TDD. Um, let me close this here. That's not important. I was just making sure I was ready to go. So in Pester, uh, your test starts with the describe block. And so this this is where you, basically your use case is. So we're gonna go describe install file when the file does not exist. And so uh, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to call install file dash path. And the only thing about Pester is it actually sets up a temporary test directory for you. I guess I don't need to keep doing the path right now. Uh, test drive uh, foobar. And so we call our install file, and then we make our assertions on what the state of our system should be. So it should create the file. And so then we go uh, to test drive to bar should exist. So we'll come down here and we'll run our tests. Come on, VM. There we go. Oh, I had a breakpoint. Let's get rid of that. Okay. So now you can see my test failed. It expected test drive foobar to exist, but it didn't. So now we're going to go over here to our function, and we're just going to go, uh, let's see, we're going to do new item, dash path, uh, path, dash item type, file. And we're going to rerun our test. And we see our, it should create the file existed. So now we'll do another use case here. We'll say, well, what happens if the file already exists? Describe install file, and the file 
already exists. So do, uh, let's see. Actually, we'll do. Uh, so we'll create a file, and then we're, we'll call install file. So I keep the duplicate in this path, so I'm going to stick this in the very end. So I don't keep duplicating it. It should, uh, let's see, it should not modify, not create the file. Uh, let's see. Uh, we want can't even really test that, so we'll do, let's see, should not throw any errors. I know that's going to fail. Initially, that file doesn't exist, so we'll do. Global error count should be zero, and then it should leave existing file alone. And so we'll go git content dash path path should be snafu, and we'll run our test. And you can see uh, we got an error. And so our error exception uh, failed. And you can see here it expected zero error. We got 12. Oops. Uh, we should probably in our test clear the errors out so that if any previous errors we don't encounter, we'll go ahead and clear those out. We can see it, it passes this should leave the existing file alone. Uh, but it fails and then it throws an error. So you can see if we uh, get rid of the there we go. See it throws that error. So now we'll go into our install file and that will implement that functionality. Uh, if not, this path that path path site then install the file. And now it just should pass. Boom. And so, um, so that, and that in a, in a nutshell, a really quick demo is, uh, is, is test-driven development, a little bit of behavior-driven development. There are a whole bunch of other tests I could spend a long time writing. You could describe install file. Uh, let's see, if parent, when parent directory doesn't exist. Make sure, we want to make sure it creates the parent directories. Uh, we want to describe install file when, um, let's see, when given a relative path, and uh, that kind of thing. And I find it helpful that when doing uh, behavior-driven development, when creating these describe blocks, uh, the, the, using the when, using that keyword when helps me figure out what, I, what the test should be doing. So it's, I usually do a function when, and then try to understand what situation I'm trying to test or uh, Something like that. That's test driven at all. So having a really good test week is a really, 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 uh, it's really the most important part of your of your pipeline because that, like I said earlier, that's the go it, that's the go no go switch, and you want to be able to have a really good suite of tests so that that no go switch can be automated, so you don't have to worry about having to go through a manual test cycle. Because manual testing, it doesn't scale. It requires somebody's time. Automated test scale, you can run them multiple times, over and over and over again, and uh, and no humans are involved. And when you can automatically deploy your software, you can really move fast. And the last stage is to release it. And this can mean a lot of different things for, for a lot of different pieces of software. Let's see here. Let's see. Ideally, your release is 100% automated. You take that package. You stick it on a server or wherever, wherever you're deploying your software to, and then that package gets either unzipped or installed. And then part of that, at the end of the day, when the package, when the release is done, you've actually got running software on that server. 
And it should also work regardless of what server you're deploying it to, whether it's a, a new, brand new server, ideally, or it's an existing server. You install that software, and run, you run the install script, and boom, you're going to get working software at the end of it. And usually there's three parts uh, to your to your to releasing your software. There's getting the code out of the machine, which is really the easiest part. If you've got a database, getting your database updated. And finally, getting your application installed and configured so that it can run. So I'm going to talk about uh, I'm going to talk about database and installer tools that we that we use and we develop. So the first is uh, applying database changes. So in the past of our company, we they were manual. So every release, you had to submit a work ticket to the DBAs. You had to include all your schema changes that you've made throughout that release. And inevitably, somebody forgot. There were two or three or four changes that people forgot, and it took two or three days to get them all put together and given to the DBAs. And so it really delayed uh, a, test, a dedicated testing phase that we had at the time. And so we took a look at, uh, I had some experience with Ruby on Rails, which automates database changes, where you write database changes in, in Ruby, and it gets applied, it, and those get applied automatically at the point of time. So I really wanted something like that uh, for our .NET applications. And I looked, took a look around. There really wasn't any good tools. There were good tools, but they didn't do what we wanted them to do. One of the key features I wanted is um, I wanted it to be a tool that not just developers could use, but DBAs would use. And I wanted it, because of the way we do our releases, we can't. Uh, we have such large data and must, such large databases, and we replicate them, that we can't actually um, do change that each migration script at a, one at a time. We have to actually consolidate them into cumulative, into a cumulative update. So we needed a tool that we could take individual changes that developers made and um, and aggregate them into, a, into, a, into a, a final product that we could deliver each release. And so I couldn't find any, so I decided to write my own. Uh, and it's called Rivet. And so here is a command on how you call Rivet. So the first one at the top there you can see, that's what you call Rivet to create a new migration script. And then there's a push switch where you take that take migration scripts and you apply them to the database. There's a pop command that re removes changes from your database and puts it back in the state it was before. And then there's a redo command which does a pop. It, re it pops the last change that you're making. Usually it's the one you've got in development. And you're iterating on it. So as you iterate on it, you're popping it, making changes, and then pushing it back onto the, onto the database until you get your, your, um, your schema right. And this is what a rivet migration looks like. You can see here a migration script consists of two functions, a push migration function and a pop migration function. And the, do, and the push one applies changes, and the pop takes them back. So you can see here we're creating a table, table called transcript with a bunch of columns on it, primary keys, indexes. We're adding a store procedure. I, I, I took out the store procedure from the screenshot for brevity. And then we're um, invoking some generic SQL DDL there to grant some permissions on the, on, the, on the store procedure. And then our pop, we're removing the store procedure, and then we're removing the table. And we're putting our, our database back in the state it was before we started mucking with it. And as you can see, this is all written. This is all PowerShell. These are all PowerShell functions. And they actually return objects. They return um, what I call migration objects. So you can see here at the top, I'm running a, a command over called git migration, where you can actually get the migration scripts and get them returned to you as, as objects. And see here all the uh, migration scripts from one of our, one of our databases here. As so you get their IDs, each, each migration is identified by a unique timestamp, and that tells us whether that's been applied to a database or not. It's got name, it's got push and pull operations on. And so we can do, you can do really cool things. Like here, we get, we're doing git migration, and then we're selecting all the push operations on it. So you can see here, the we have this code here, when it gets converted into objects, it turns into this. So we've got this. The first object is an add table object, and then the next one is uh, adding a primary key object, and so on and so on. And we use this object model to take a bunch of changes and compress them down into the minimal amount of change. So a developer made, created a table, and then added a column to the table, and then dropped the column. Uh, the, the script, the DBA is going to then is the add table with the new column and without the column that got dropped. They get the cumulative change, which is very nice in, a, in our environment with our, our large data sets. All right, as you want to get more information on Rivet, the documentation is published out at git-rivet.org.
there's no you have to down, download it from source at the moment. I'm working I'm working on uh, actually getting up into the PowerShell gallery on chocolatey and nougat. Uh, uh, it's one of my to do items, but you can you can download. Uh, I think it's tagged in source. So you can just grab the latest version. Everything's checked in the source. You don't actually need to build anything. So uh, as part of uh, now you get to get your app installed. Let's see here. Now historically, um, especially in, in Windows land, I think we have this this wonderful history of, of having manual checklists, and they're almost like you know magic potions, uh, where you have to go through them exactly step by step, and if you miss a step, uh, you, you could be out of luck. Uh, and, the, and these manual and these steps, you know, they can get your service to be unique snowflakes, uh, but most of the time they actually turn it into just monstrosity servers because people are making manual changes left and right. Some of them are being captured in whatever checklist you've got. Um, and it's just, it's, it's just, it's crazy. Another thing that really sucks about manual checklists is they're super, super boring and tedious to run. And by about the five, fifth, or sixth, or seventh, or eighth time uh, running a manual checklist, you just you just want to go find another job or, or do something to entertain. And so when I learned PowerShell, I looked around and said, okay, there's got to be some kind of automation firm that's going to help me get my websites installed, get my apps configured, grant permissions, that kind of thing. And and there wasn't there wasn't anything out there that I found. And so again, I, I started writing uh, writing my own my own platform, and that's was born uh, my module called Carbon. And this is some Carbon script here. Uh, Carbon's a collection of functions that just helps you configure Windows machines. So this is a part of a script that we use to install. Uh, we use Mercurial here. And so this is the script we use to install the Mercurial website. And so you can see we're installing an IS app pool. We're installing a web root, creating a web share so people can view files and clone repos a bit faster, granting permissions, installing the website. Setting up SSL and doing some uh, other IS customizations to allow uh, uh, domain credentials, domain logins. And here's the more of the same thing where we're installing shares and granting permissions, and so we can deploy updated config to our, our website. And if you were to actually look at some of this code inside Carbon, it's 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 dozens and hundreds, some of them are hundreds of lines of lo lines of code long. Um, where it takes into account if something exists, if it doesn't exist. Um, all of Carbon's functions are item potent, which means you can run them multiple times, and if it, it only makes changes if it needs to, if things are out of date. So this really simplifies your scripts. Um, it makes it really, really easy to understand what's going on. And so here's, I'm just going to give a quick survey of, a, of, the, of the most important features of Carbon and what it does. Um, you can install certificates. You can also install those certificates on remote machines. You can grant permissions on those um, private key certificates. Let's see, you can install, work with the registry by installing registry keys, setting registry key values. I find that the PowerShell native APIs for the registry um, lacking. It's a little bit kludgy, a little bit clumsy to work with. And so uh, I wrote some wrappers around this to make it really, really easy. You can grant permissions on the registry, grant permissions on the file system. Uh, here's one, install service. This, this is probably the longest function in Carbon if you actually look at the source code. Uh, I think it might be one or two hundred lines of code. There's so much you have to do to get a service installed. You have to grant the service to the right, right privileges, um, and to make sure the service exists, and do all sorts of, um, of stuff. And, and then you can, al you can also, with Carbon, grant service permissions. So you can give people permissions to restart a specific service, to query specific services, and this is what we do for our deployment user. We grant our deployment users permission to control a service so that before we do a deploy, that user can stop the services, do the deployment, and start them back up. And then that user doesn't need to be admin, which is nice. Uh, if anybody's had, ever needed to know what software is installed uh, and had, you had to work with the WMI objects, you know those can be dangerous because they actually fire off a validation check on your installers, which can actually reinstall your software and, and do unintended things. And so Carbon has a git program install info function, which just queries the registry and gets all the information uh, that you see in the programs and features control panel uh, right out in, in PowerShell. And then we do a bunch of stuff with cryptography and protecting secrets. One of the things we do is we actually uh, have password files that we encrypt our secrets in, and those password files get deployed out to uh, our servers. 
and we have different keys for different environments. And so we encrypt our secrets for a dev environment with a different key, and then with test and staging. And, uh, and then those private keys we use to decrypt are actually kept secret by whoever owns those environments. So here we're at the top, we're generating a new RSA key pair uh, for uh, encrypting. And so with public and private key pairs, you can encrypt anything with the public key. Anybody can encrypt the secret, but only somebody with a private key can decrypt it. And so that private key is what's installed on, on, the, on the web servers that need to decrypt the secrets. And that's what's guarded by our ops team and by our team. And then we have a function called protect string, which will can encrypt things with a key. It can encrypt things with Microsoft's data protection API uh, for encrypting things on specific machines. Uh, and then it has a, an equivalent unprotect string for doing the reverse, for getting the plain text out with certificates and keys and Microsoft's DP API. And then we have uh, local user and group functions. So you can install a user, install a group. You can grant privileges. To those users, you can resolve identities. This is very useful for you, like the canonical name for a user. I use it all over Carver and all of our, our, uh, our automation. And some people may ask, well, why Carver just released these? Why why would we use Carver? Well, the car, this is this works in Carver four, so you can actually I mean in PowerShell four, so you can use it on uh, on a servers that haven't been able to upgrade the, the latest version of PowerShell. And then we're a web-based company, so we do a lot of website deployments. And so we have a whole slew of functions that work with IIS, installing app pools, websites, applications, virtual directories, enabling and managing IIS, SSL, and uh, all of the good stuff that you need. And it has some fallback functions in case the Kerman doesn't have a function, you can actually easily work with the uh, web management API. And Carbon does a whole bunch of other different things uh, that we didn't cover. It manages com permissions. Uh, let's see, you can manage global, .NET settings and database connections, that kind of thing. Uh, install and read MSIs. You can actually read properties from MSIs, which is nice. So you can discover what kind of uh, properties you can send to an installer to do um, standalone, unattended installers. Let's see, it'll do NTF compressions, manage junctions, uh, it'll reach firewall rules, manages host files and INI files. Stuff. Performance counters, schedule tasks, you can install schedule tasks, that kind of thing. Let's see. Now, some people ask, well, why don't you use a tool to do a, a tool to do all this install? Why don't you use whatever your tool you're using to deploy, why don't you use, use that to do your installs? And a lot of people do do that, and we chose we chose not to because we want the same great install experience for developers. So when a new developer starts at our company, they can clone our repository and run in, in the same install script that we run in all the other environments. They run and boom, at the end of it, they've got a working piece of software. Otherwise, if you have a separate tool to do it, you have to either figure out a way for that tool to run and raise compete on every every developer's machine, which some companies do, um, or there's separate steps for the developers to follow to get their computer set up, and those are never kept in step with the automation. And so developers end up using the first week of their of their job just to get their software installed, and who knows if it's actually installed correctly. And so that's why we write all our stuff in PowerShell so that we can use it across every environment, even on, even on developer machines all the way out to live. So to get more information, uh, you can go to git-carbon.org. Uh, every single function of Carbon is documented. There's some helpful, very helpful about, top, about topics as well. When you go to this website, there's a link to the actual Right now it's hosted in Bitbucket on our material where you can go and actually look at the source code and submit issues and uh, contribute if you, if, you, uh, if you wanted to. Now one thing that I want to talk about is, is code versus configuration. I don't know if any of you have ever seen this kind of a pattern in your scripts where if you're in, an, in the specific, you're testing if you're in a specific environment and then you're doing something differently based on each of those environments. Uh, usually if you see this somewhere, you're going to see it scattered all over your code base. And this, that does not scale because if you ever have to add another environment, you have to go through all, you have to search through all your code and find everywhere where you've got one of these if, if else switch statements and add that environment in all those, all those, uh, in all those places. So what we did to solve this problem is we stick our settings in a, in a hash table. And uh, you can see here, uh, we've got a dev test and a live environment, and those are sub-hash tab hash tables in this hash table. And so we can specify 
the settings for specific environments, and then we have a global function where you pass it the hash table, and it'll actually look in the hash table based on the you pass it the environment and the setting you want, and it'll actually look in the hash table for that setting. And if an environment doesn't have a setting, you can have it inherit from parent settings. So you can have like one of let's say there's a dev environment. And the developers' machines, they're almost like dev, but not quite. So you can actually have a developer environment that inherits from dev, so that when this function looks up a setting, if it's not found in the, in the root environment or in the, in the first environment, the leaf environment, we'll then look up this, this uh, inheritance tree and look for the setting. And this makes it really, really easy to set up, to spin up new environments, because you can just add the environment to your settings hash and then inherit it from the one that it's most similar to, and then just change the configuration. That, uh, that applies to that environment. This is very, very helpful. Uh, it doesn't scale well. If you, have a, if you have a big application with a lot, a lot of settings, it can get hard to manage and, and view those settings and understand what's going on. Um, but I think it's worth that trade-off. It's, it's worth, it's, I'd rather have that problem, the management of a big, big, huge hash table, than, than that problem. Uh, let's see here. So that's, uh, that's kind of an overview of the tools that we use uh, at WebMD. To, uh, to do our, our pipelines. And I wanted to talk a little more and get PowerShell specific on what kind of pipelines that, uh, that I use, that we use for our PowerShell modules. We have, a, we have some uh, internal modules that we've built. And they all, some of them, they all can use slightly different uh, pipelines to get, their, uh, to get their code out the door. This is what I call the branch pipeline. And so what happens is you check code into an actor branch, some kind of development or a crew branch that where all the development work goes. And then you build from that branch in source control, and you, you build, and then you run your tests against it. And if all your tests pass, those changes get pushed automatically to a stable branch. And then anybody that wants to use your software, they just they just need to pull the latest from your stable branch because whatever gets pushed into stable is stable and it's good to go. Uh, this is really nice for we have uh, for something that you some kind of we have use it for and we use it for an internal tool to keep our developer machines up to date on a nightly basis. So every day. On our developer machines, we have a job that runs that downloads the latest global configuration from the stable branch and applies it to, to everybody's machines. And so when we have new certificates or new configuration that needs to get rolled out, uh, we use this pattern to, to, keep the, to keep those repositories up to date. The first thing that automation does is it downloads the latest and reruns itself if it's, if it's out of date. Uh, a, t a tagging pipeline. So here again, you're checking code in the source control. It's building, it's testing. Um, and then this tag step is actually a manual step. So it lets you accumulate changes. You only release changes when you're ready to. And this is, we use this for our actual automation platform that we share across all our applications and all our repositories. But when, and teams are responsible for managing that in their repositories. Uh, and so a team maybe on version 1.0 and a year later, they come back, and it's time for them to upgrade to 2.0. So they can just go into the source control, pull the latest, and then update the latest uh, release version 2.0. Part of this requires that you have really good release notes so that people, when people upgrade to your new uh, to your new software, they can see what's changed between between each version. And we use this. We have, like I said, we use this for our global automation platform. Um, and this, uh, the on, an on-demand pipeline, this is the ideal state for, for independent PowerShell modules. Code gets checked into source. You build it. You build a package of your module that uh, you would use to, to publish out to, the, to everybody. You would run tests against that. And then you, while, until you release, you stash that version of whatever you package up in an artifact repository. And then when you're ready to release, when you determine, okay, I've accumulated enough changes, I'm going to release this package out, you then hit a button or run a script that releases whatever package, whatever version package you want uh, to get released. This requires a little bit of infrastructure. It requires you to be able to have something that you, someplace where you stick your packages, and then someplace that will run your, your build pipeline, and someplace that will run your release pipeline. Um, usually tools like Jenkins work, uh, and things like that, build servers and things like that will work very well for, for something like this. In Jenkins, I believe the release process is called promotion. So you uh, create an artifact and then promote that in, in Jenkins. And then the last thing I like to call this the poor man's pipeline. If you don't have infrastructure, which uh, actually this is the pattern I do, this is just a simplified version of, of the on-demand pipeline. 
Uh, in the poor man's pipeline, you don't have that infrastructure. So basically, you're just doing this on a long, local machine. Uh, whenever you do a check-in, you run your build and run your tests. And then when you're ready to release uh, your software, then you run some kind of release script that generates your package and, and, and publishes them out. This is the process I use for Carbon and a couple of the other, and uh, one or two other um, modules that I have out on the, on the, one other module that I have in the gallery. Hopefully more will be coming soon. But, um, so I've got, like I said, I've got two modules that are out on the gallery, and I've got two or three others that I want to get out of the gallery. And so this is, this is a lot of boilerplate code, all this building of building and testing PowerShell modules, they're all pretty much the same. And so I've actually, one of the modules I want to get out there is a module called Silk, which is a tool set that actually helps do all this, it does all this boilerplate stuff for you. It helps um, build your stuff and test it, and well, it doesn't do, do testing yet, and then it helps package things up and publish them out to wherever you need them to be published. So I'm going to, I'm going to show some script on what that looks like. So this is, this is a, uh, last week I released a new module called libgit2. It's a PowerShell module that we're working with Git repositories. We do a lot of source control automation, and we're moving from Mercurial to Git. And so we need, we need, the, we need the module that, that does this. And so this is our script that builds this module. It contains an assembly and has some dependent assemblies, so it has to kind of package them together. So that set module version function that you see at the top, that should actually just be, that, that's what actually compiles the software. And, uh, and then we take that compiled software and we copy it into our module bin, uh, and then we run tests again. We run our, our pester test suite against it. If the tests fail, we just exit out and, and cancel our build. Um, and so some of the things Silk does, it's kind of a pain on how things are organized, but what it can do is it actually, It'll look, look in some files and configuration in your module, and it'll set your version for you. So if you have there's one canonical place that gets, it gets a version, then it'll go through all your assemblies and your module manifest, and it'll set versions everywhere so that when, you're, when, you're, when you compile your code and release your module, it's all the same version, uh, which is really nice. Uh, helps people uh, upgrade a lot easier. And then after we've built, uh, then we actually package up the module. So we open up our release notes file, and we set the date that the release is going to happen. Uh, we update the uh, module manifest. Uh, PowerShell Gallery looks at the module manifest metadata, and then displays a bunch of stuff, like release notes and tags and things like that in the UI. Uh, and then I release my modules on both Chocolatey and Nougat, which require a new spec, uh, which uses uh, Nougat under the hood. So there's a special new spec file which is used to create a, a NuGet package. And so the next set module, module new spec does the same thing. It sets the version, adds the release notes, and other metadata to that new spec so you can actually create a, a NuGet package. And then it uh, generates the NuGet package, and it generates a chocolatey package. And then lastly, we create just a, a loose file, a loose directory in the file system for a module that we'll use to publish to the PowerShell gallery. And then we'll include copies of the release notes and our licenses and everything in our module as well. So this is the build. This is a Silk-based build script. All these set functions and new functions. These are all these are all part of Silk. And then this is this is what a publish looks like. So when I'm ready to publish, I run this script, and it grabs whatever uh, NuGet packages I've got and chocolatey packages and publishes them out to NuGet.org and chocolatey.org, and then it grabs that directory that uh, where the module got set aside and it uses that to publish it out to the PowerShell. The PowerShell Gallery. Uh, let's see, that might be no. And then, oh, another thing Silk does is I think documentation is your most important feature. If you something's not documented, nobody's going to use it. And so, uh, Silk actually started out as a as a library used to generate documentation. So all of Carbon's documentation and LibGit2's documentation is all written in, in comment based help. You can see all we, we can actually show an example over here. Oops. So install file here. Yep, you can see here, this is this this is a uh, comment-based help, but it's written in Markdown. You can see here in Markdown, the back tick operator means make this look like code. And so Silk has a bunch of functions that convert this convert help. It work. It'll actually work for anything, regardless of where your help comes from, whether it's comment-based help or XML help or wherever. Uh, it converts that help into HTML. And so let's see where's my. Here we go. And so this is the script I used to 
to generate the actual libgit, the git dash libgit two dot org website. Mm -hmm. The one for carbon and the ribbon look, this, look almost exactly alike, where it'll actually, um, I should probably pull up. Um, anyway, it creates an index page that lists all your functions, uh, and you can actually use tags to organize them as well. Uh, and then it goes through all your functions and generates a, dedicated, a specific page for it. It converts your about topics to help as well. Um, I'll show you an example. Git carbon is the. So here's the Git, here's the Git carbon website. And this, all this, this all comes from um, PowerShell help. So this, this page is actually the about underscore carbon help topic. And so if you click on install here, this is from the about carbon installation help topic. And then if you look on documentation, Silk generates this index page for you. You can give it a list of tags. And so you can tag your functions. So you carbon has so many, you kind of have, have to tag them so that it's easier to find things. Uh, but then it's got this really cool tab interface where you can do it by tag. You can just do it by an alphabetical list of names, or you can just, or it also creates a tab for verbs. You can look up things based on specific verbs. All this whole website, the, even the release notes, are all written in, in Markdown and Silk. I use Silk to generate all this HTML and and shove it out to the internet. And this is the, and this is just an example of how that works. That's, yeah, that's the last one. So Silk is, um, it gets the least love, but I think it should be actually get the most love from, from my time. I really need to write some documentation for it and, and get, get it published out because I think it's a really, really valuable tool. And eventually I want to get to a point where you don't actually have to write any of this. You can just, there'll be a some kind of a JSON or a configuration file where you tell it how your module works. And then Silk just looks at it and says, okay, your module works like this. I'll generate the help over here in this way or um, I'll build this way, here's where you keep your version number, um, I'll package for these things, and I'll publish out to these, these repositories. That's, that's the next step that I had that so can go down. Right now, you kind of have to put it all together yourself. Um, to learn more, to see the actually, to grab this, this code for Silk, it's out here. Like I said, I'm not very proud of the fact that it's not very well documented. Um, the best thing to do is to go out to Carbon and the libgit2 module, which are also under that shoot, uh, uh, Poshdu uh, user on GitHub and see how those modules are using Silk. Uh, that's going to be your best bet until I get some documentation ready. Let's see, I think. Check my notes here. Make sure I didn't miss anything. Nope. And and that's it. So here are all the all the helpful links uh, to all the tools that I talked about today and the other ways you can uh, you can get a hold of me if, if you need to. And that's that. Thank you very much for your time. I'll like if I can do, I, could, I should probably do questions. Let's go over here. Uh, let's see, one of the questions, I guess you can install Carbon on every server that uses the credentials or string you're trying to protect. Yeah, you said, yeah, you would need to install Carbon everywhere you wanted to. You would want to decrypt those credentials. And so what, what we do is we actually pack, like I said, when I said we create a package, we actually package Carbon with the software that we're installing. So it kind of goes along with it. And so like the install script, one of the first things the install script does is it actually imports carbon. And then it has and it's all it's got all that stuff available. And we've also we've also built our own kind of secret store. We have our own password file that we've got functions that say, hey give me this password. And that function takes care of figuring out what environment you're in, what password file to look up, what key to use, and that kind of thing. But yeah, you do you need to get new carbon. That's why the package is so important. You put everything together in one package, and it just kind of goes wherever you need to go. There's no the package shouldn't have any prerequisite prerequisites except for running a Windows server. Are there uh, are there any other questions? Actually, when I went and installed Carbon while uh, from the PowerShell gallery <laughs> while you were going over it. Yeah. Yeah, just install. I've got it. If you uh, uh, get modules on carbon, write in your um, your uh, as part of chocolatey and nougat. You can do a choco install carbon, and it'll also do the same exact thing. And it'll install carbon in the same place. And then uh, nougat. Uh, if you just I just put it on nougat because why not? <laughs> it's not really a uh, 
a .NET assembly that people would reference. I don't recommend it, but if you just want to get the actual bare files, that's usually your best bet because a, a newbie package is just a zip file, so you just download it and open it up with a zip, uh, just change the extension to .zip and, and take a look at it. Hey, Aaron, or possibly Mike, um, I'm kind of curious. I've been trying to find good examples of pester, you know, use cases or, or test cases, right? <laughs> pun intended, um, that I can apply to what we do, right, with, with PowerShell. A lot of what we do interacts with other APIs. You know, it could be PowerCLI or AD commandlets or maybe some module we wrote to interact with another company's API in the cloud. Um, is Would you say that's not a good um, application for Pester, or is there maybe some uh, standards for that? So. You're asking if, uh, so are you writing wrapper functions around these other APIs? Right, or in the case where, like, we create our own module to interact with an API through REST. Yeah, so that's definitely a really good use for Pester. Um, one thing you want to be careful is you don't, you don't want to end up testing the API that you're using. And what's really cool about Pester is you can actually, um, what's called mock out those commands. So you don't actually call them. Um, and it actually, uh, for, in some instances, it, it's, It'll save your tests a lot of time because they won't actually have to go out and do that work, and you don't have to spin up. Like if you're if you're interacting with Power CLI, you don't want your test to actually interact with Power CLI and spin up VMs because you're going to be waiting forever for those tests to pass. Right. So, Pester, you can actually mock out those commands, and then you can assert that those commands were called in the way you expect them to. Mm -hmm. that sense. Okay. Does that does that answer your question? Uh, yeah, it, it gives me some insight. I'm I'm still thinking. You know, as you talked through that, I started thinking, well, one big problem I have, and I don't know that there's a, really a fix for this, is I'm interacting still with APIs that may change, especially yeah. cloud services. So, you know, I don't have any control over that. It's not like an on-prem product that we can control the releases. Right, and so that, um, that's actually a really good reason to have a, a test fixture so that you can uh, download the latest version and then run your tests against that latest version to make sure, to see if anything's changed. If mm -hmm. you didn't have those test suites, you would you'd have to actually kind of inspect your code and go through it and look to see what's changed. But if you have automated tests, if you wrap that mod that that API in your own module, you can just run your tests, um, and that way you're only testing the parts of the API that you're actually using and making sure it's up to date. That's actually saved our saved saved us one time where, uh, like I said, we use we currently use Mercurial, and at one point Mercurial introduced a uh, regression that broke one of our, our crucial uh, workflows, and we had wrapped Mercurial. It wasn't a, it, it was a, just an EXE, but we had wrapped it in a PowerShell module. And when we ran our test against it, one of our tests failed. And when we did some research, we realized, oh, they may have a regression. We can't upgrade to this version of Mercurial. It took them two years to fix it, um, but it actually saved us from pushing out a change that uh, that would have done some could have done some uh, caused us a lot of work uh, to fix. Gotcha. And I don't have any um, good examples for mocks in many of my open source models because most of our, most of my stuff sits at the bottom of, of, of an automation stack. Um, yeah, so I don't have any really good examples. I think the Pester uh, the Pester GitHub repository has some examples on how to do it. Okay, and so I guess when you're talking about modules, that makes sense if we write our own modules. But in the case where we write a script that uses other modules. Maybe that's not a good candidate for Pester. No, I think it, I think it's all a good candidate for Pester. Okay. Yeah, so depending on what you're calling, you can either mock it out or not. Um, it just it just depends on how intense whatever whatever module other module you're calling, whatever it does, that's going to kind of determine if you're going to mock it out. If it does a lot of things um, and it requires a lot of setup, then you probably want to mock it out. Otherwise, just let it do its thing. We have some on our automation platform. We wrap a lot of carpet stuff. And we end up mocking some of Carbon's functions because we don't actually want Carbon to do what it's doing. We're not really we're not really concerned about what Carbon's doing. We're concerned about what our stuff is, how our stuff is interacting with it. If that makes sense. Yeah, yeah, it does. Which brings up a good point where if you are mocking something from an API, you should always have one or two tests that don't mock that actually use the API. Um, just because I found really weird instances where. The mocking, mocking it works great, but when you actually go out and use the actual things, some really weird um, things that happen. 
uh, that, that mocking doesn't catch. So you should usually have one or two tests that actually use the API to do something. Okay. Possible. If we have any more questions, feel free to uh, unmute, or if you don't have a mic, you can uh, type it in the chat. I think someone was typing a question and stopped. Maybe it was answered. Yes, it's the Carbon is, is the result of uh, three or four years of concerted effort. Uh, Rivet, uh, we've had that for a year or two. So again, there's a lot of time and energy that have gone into Carbon, and it's it's actually so um, it's so complete for us. We actually I used to you know, develop it at work, and now that it's gotten more popular, we're at this point where people are actually submitting issues and problems with it. Um, but I don't have time because I'm, we, we actually don't work on, you don't do much on carving more because it, it does a lot, it solves a lot of our problems. Um, so I'm in this weird place where carving needs some love, but I don't have any, I don't need, I don't need to get a love at work, and so I have to find time on my, on my own to, to give it some love. Uh, so if anybody wants to get involved in an open source project, uh, there's, there are some issues on, for carbon out there and um, that uh, you could come contribute to. So uh, any other questions? No. All right. Well, if anybody, if you ever, I'm, I love to hear people's feedback, um, good or good or bad. So you can, you know, uh, file an issue at, at the GitHub or the Bitbucket repositories that I've got, or shoot me a question on Twitter. Uh, my handle again is uh, poshdo p s h d o on Twitter, and then here's my email address. You can send me an email as well. Oh, yeah, there we go. Thank you. That's a good place to put that. I really enjoyed the presentation, Aaron. Uh, I, there's several things in there that I saw that I could use, and that's why I went ahead and installed Carbon. Uh, I've definitely got to uh, take a look at this. Uh, matter of fact, there's some things that I was thinking about working on that I think you have already done that I won't have to go reinvent the wheel. Yay. And really, when it comes down, I think my motivation for doing both Rivet and Carbon is even when I go find another job, I don't have to rewrite all that code. I do, I'm i one of the available for my next job. So uh, I was able, fortunately able to get permission to open source all that but, uh, so I can take all my all my nice code that I wrote with me. That's awesome. Uh, and I, we appreciate your, t your time for uh, doing this presentation. And I believe Ron recorded it, so uh, so we should be able to get it out there so even more people can uh, can enjoy it. Yeah, that'd be, that'd be great. Yeah, very cool. I appreciate it. Very good presentation. Thank you.